the world is more focused in that it's a very specific area, sort of DC and sort of the surrounding suburbs. It's a large scale map and it's a pretty huge world, but it's very tight in that it's, it's basically one region. There's a, it's very cohesive. I was thinking of setting it on the west coast. Um, Emil really pushed, oh, we should, we should do it out here. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if that has the right fallout feel, you know. Um, but the more we thought about it, it was, oh, yeah, we got it. Who can blow up Washington, D.C. better than us? If you look at the Fallout universe, it was necessary to make a split, to take the series where we wanted to go with it. You wanted to get away from the West Coast. You want to get away from the playground that we knew in 1 and 2. So we came all the way over here. It's what we know. And then there's just a lot of great symbolism in having D.C. in a post-nuclear landscape. There's lots of great architecture that we all know and love from the area. So it was just a natural fit, I think. I spend a lot of my time on weekends going through D.C. with a digital camera. And when you're going around the White House taking pictures of manhole covers, uh, people want to know why you're taking pictures of manhole covers around the White House. And I always thought to myself, well, my answer would be very simple. I'm just imagining what this would all look like if it was blown up. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how the wasteland around here would actually look. Um, and going and visiting buildings they had knocked down in DC. They, they, no they knocked down a few buildings and we would go and click, 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 click. Um, just to see what destruction down there would look like. For me, uh, a lot of times when you design the architecture, and especially in a sci-fi sense, and then you walk down that street, uh, there's a lot of material for you to play with. Uh, looking at a lot of buildings, I would walk in Adams Morgan and I'd see a cluster of houses and I'd say, wow, that's amazing. All right, we put a lot of chrome flanges on them, but just the configurations of things would give you ideas and one would bounce off of the other. So it was a continuous process. We were able to really stick to the modern vision of DC with just these quirks, this Art Deco stuff, stuff that never existed in our world that would have existed in their world if we extrapolate on what these people and their core values were important to them. So the Googie architecture and stuff like that, that all appears. It's there on the sides of the buildings and it's sort of tacked on. So you see an ancient neoclassical building that's got metal barricading just sheeted onto the side of it in case of a nuclear strike, like profiteering you know, third-party companies putting the coin-operated vault shelters on the, on the side of the street so you can put a quarter in in case there's a blast and hide in there. Just lots of neat little things like that that we try to do. The landmarks we use and the flavor of it, if you're from around here, there's enough of it where you get it, but not so much that it's any sort of handicap to someone who isn't. And the fact that we kind of had an alternate history helped a lot. So because the Fallout universe splits around 1950, we could take great liberties with DC. So we have all of these books in Washington, DC. So that the things that were pre the time when we split, we're careful about after that. You know, if a certain thing was built after that, we try actually not to even have it. Or we'll build it in a different way, in a way that we think suits the game better, and our excuse can be, well, in our timeline, they, they built it different. All the majors are there, right? We've got the Jefferson, plays a big part the Washington, the Lincoln, the Capitol, the White House, and uh, more contemporary stuff like the Air Force Memorial obviously wouldn't be there in their world. But we do try and capture inspirations of some things. We have so much fun doing this. It's, like, it's almost a guilty pleasure for us. It really is the best job in the world. So it's like, you feel kind of guilty in the game or like in the Capitol building fighting super mutants and like, you know, body parts are blowing up. And it's just a big joke, you know what I mean? It's just. It's pure escapist entertainment. It's crazy, and you, you try not to get wrapped up on the seriousness of it. It's a massive world, and there's a lot of small elements that have to be individually created, which will all come together at some point to sort of finish off the spaces, to all the cluttering, all the architecture, all the environments, the lighting, the effects. There are so many elements, and that, you know, a lot of it is just kind of, you know, guessing, okay, the, the whoops. <laughs> that was a big one. You don't need computers. Draw it up. <laughs> Where are you going? All you know the triangles this is the new frame rate. <laughs> we had some electric storms pass through and uh, basically down power lines. Trees went down. It was pretty insane. We uh, lost power for a good, I would say about eight to ten hours. It happened around three o'clock yesterday. Uh, it's a little weird because usually, you know, when it rains around here, we do lose power for like a brief two, three minutes. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of like business as usual, but, but then the power never came back. At this point, I don't, I don't see a lot of changes affecting, like, you know, data side. No 
no one should be waiting for that. And if, it, if it's that important, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll bring it over. We have a big milestone coming up next week. So that meeting actually was all about how do we get the game ready for this milestone. And you know, there are people who will stay here as late as they need to and to get stuff done. We've had stuff like this happen before. We've put builds on planes and flown people you know, to save time. It's amazing the things that you'll do to get things done. Now, when the power went out the other day, uh, a bunch of us went over to the, like, let's get out of here, the power's out. So we went over to the supermarket and the power was out there, but they, they had enough emergency power to run the cash registers. So they're feel free, you can buy whatever you want, but all of the aisles are dark. So I start walking the aisles and I, I you know, do you have like a, you know, Starbucks bottle thing? I need some coffee. So we start wandering the aisles, it's all pitch black and I'm using my iPhone as like a flashlight. Um, and, I, and I said to one of the guys like, this is how the world ends, man. This is cool. Like we're in the game. Like, what else should we get? And one guy's like, antibiotics. <laughs> you know, like, get antibiotics before food. And we're like working it out in the aisle at Safeway. Just the other day. So yeah, sometimes it creeps in your head. We felt we needed to do something new with role-playing and guns. The original inspiration was, um, imagine burnout crash mode with body parts. And we talked about it, I and mean, Emil came up with the name. The acronym is sort of an homage to the, the FEV VATS in Fallout 1. It's, you know, where the super mutants got created from. We were sort of looking for, for an homage, and, and that's just sort of fit the, the vault tech assisted targeting system. Sure, I could shoot a guy in the legs and run and gun, but in VATS, you have a certain amount of action points. So it allows you to actually make a measured, precise shot on the legs, cripple them so he'll move slower, take out the arms, he'll, he'll be less accurate with the gun, the head has a higher chance to critical. So it might blow up, but it's harder to hit. So really taking all the stuff from Fallout 1 and 2 and sort of trying to bring that into a new next-gen type of game. That was one of our goals initially was we didn't want it to just be a shooter. That the kind of stuff we do, we want to try something that attaches you to your character, that lets you have your character on the screen do something you, the player, can't do. That your character can go in and advance blow the leg off one guy, the head off another, and the arm off another in some equilibrium style, pop, 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 that you, unless you were like Call of Duty Ninja Master, you could never do as a player. It's like we want you to feel super powerful in those moments because your character in the world is super powerful even though you were born with an extra big left thumb or something. Todd's fond of saying that great games are played, not made, and that's certainly true, because we knew what we wanted to do with it, we knew we wanted to have the ability to queue up shots at somebody on specific parts of their bodies, and then play that back in a cinematic fashion. And that's what we, we knew that we wanted to do. We had talked originally about, you know, let's not have it pause the screen, let's have it, you know, be a, a, a sort of slow motion thing, and I was like, how many times have you been playing like a first person game and being startled by something and just want to break and you just want to be able to stop and assess the situation tactically and pausing the game and, and allowing you to target the body parts allows you to do that. So I'm really happy with the way that came up. We'll put something in with as many dials, tuning things as we can. And then we'd sit there and tune it week by week to, well now it's more like this. And then people will say, well, how should I be using it? I don't know. Go use it and then tell us what you think. Um, and the one thing everybody loved were, were the playbacks, you know, when people died in fabulous ways or showed your character doing something really cool. So we had to separate VATS really into two entities. One was the gameplay part of it, the numbers. What is my character doing when he shoots your arm? What are the numbers? How fast do I get him back? And then there was the playback, which all went to art in terms of being a cinematic joy buzzer. 
thing that excites me most is the uh, the combat, the violence content especially. It is just, it is a fantastic amount of fun to get a, a shotgun and blow a mutant's head off in slow motion and watch the eyeballs go flying all over the screen. The mandate was to push it really far over the top. We didn't want it to be realistically disturbing. We wanted it to be cartoony. I've done a lot of it. I haven't done it all. Our previous character lead, thankfully, the person who actually scoured websites and found uh, a lot of the photo reference that we wound up having to use. Awful stuff. Don't recommend it. Um, and people were walking by <laughs> and uh, getting very, 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 very sick and telling me that I should, you know, put a warning up. And so I did, because I thought it was funny. I'm a big believer that if you can make, in a game like this, where you're killing lots and lots of things, if you can make that repetitive action really entertaining, like that's where the rubber meets the road in a lot of these games. So this is something I know the player's gonna do 10,000 times. Make that as entertaining as you can, and the rest of it is pretty much great. So we spent a lot of time just on that moment. How does it sound? What is the physics like? What's the camera like? And then, adding lots of cameras so it doesn't get repetitive. I think it really adds something that's really fun and entertaining to the game that we haven't really seen before. Our game is primarily first person, so when you have guns in first person, you, you, the bar has been raised, but it's tough because we're an, we're an RPG, not a shooter. So it's a mixture of, it's not just the player skill, it's your character skill too. Uh, the first thing we did was we took a bow and arrow from Oblivion and we made a bow and arrow gun. <laughs> that shot rapid fire arrows and it didn't quite work right. Uh, so we had to we had to build up that whole system from scratch. Uh, the hardest part has definitely been how you do gun combat within an RPG, how your stats affect your aim, affect your damage. Uh, we've been over that hundreds and hundreds of times, how much the guns spread, how much damage they do, and trying to make you feel like you're getting better as you get more powerful. It's not like Oblivion, you level up automatically. Uh, because it's an experience point based game so that will happen organically as you play the game you have different weapon skills too so a small handgun is determined by the small gun skill so if you jack that skill up uh, you know a small handgun will be pretty damn effective you know it, it fires more quickly you'll get more sh shots off and fast it's a constant balancing act for us to find that right balance between you know RPG skill and player skill and making the guy take long enough to die but have it feel realistic too the designers made a lot of decisions about what they wanted to do um, in terms of the weapons. We had some fantastical sort of weapons that we made that are fun, like we have a weapon that shoots junk. You just junk, random junk you collect around the world, um, and you just load it up into it and you can shoot out teddy bears and, you know, and tin cans and typewriters and that sort of thing. But in terms of how to make them work realistically, most of that was just playing the game. Um, we have a lot of numbers, we can adjust the numbers, um, how fast does this weapon fire, how long does it take to reload it, um, what sorts of ammo does it take, the animations and all that are all done by the art department, but mostly it's feel in terms of how the weapon works, as opposed to this is exactly how this particular weapon in the real world fires. Um, you want to make it, you know, again, you want to make it fun to play and compelling to play. What we definitely wanted to do with the gun stuff is not do everything that everyone else has done. So, you know, we have some weapons that you can craft and some unique weapons, you know, like the railway rifle that shoots railway spikes, and, you know. So we had a lot of fun with doing that type of stuff. Our lead artist, Estevan, that guy's from Mars, man. He can do anything. And he designed a lot of the guns, the laser rifles. You could build that thing. He knows how it works. It's that part of it that I think maybe people don't see behind the scenes when we, when we concept the stuff, you know. And we know what the knobs do.